It is what it is. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm actually really excited because I get to present this thing that I've been working on with Vikenti for a very long time. Uh, Vikenti is here as well. Vikenti, could you say hi? Hello, everyone. So um, this is a, a shared talk. Unfortunately, Vikenti doesn't have, he has a worse internet connection than I do. So he, he decided that he's going to let me uh, do all of this. And uh, as usual, he will do the actual work. Uh, Vikenti, who is, whoever is not familiar with him, I really recommend seeing a talk in which he describes how he created, uh, basically he wrote Excess uh, for Perl, but in Rust. So you could actually write Excess in Rust and create bindings in Rust for Perl. It's really cool. He's brilliant, and uh, and I'm I'm gonna try to thoroughly embarrass him. Um, guacamole is something that we've been working on for about uh, I would say two months now, and it actually started roughly four years ago. Uh, but now we've we've actually went back to it and, and finished it, and it is a Perl parser toolkit. So, what does that mean? Um, I'm going to cover what guacamole is. I'm going to cover how it works. I'm going to cover what you could use it for and what tools are already available in it, which, you know, it, before we do this, though, I think some bonding would be uh, in order here. I, everyone's on mute, so I'm not going to hear you laugh, but I imagine that maybe some, some you know, sometimes awkward stuff make us laugh. So let's let's play with some awkward stuff. Um, does anyone know if this is a hash ref or a block? This is a syntax for both a hash ref and a block. Um, in Perl, because it's the only statement and it's the last one, it's a, it's a hash ref. But what happens if I try to do two? Would the first one be a block and then the second be a hash ref? Or what happens if I do put, just put a comma, no content? Or if I put a semicolon? Or did you know that you could do this? You could actually use the the hash, the the, the, sh the, the that will work. You can actually use it as the limiter. Did you know that you could use every character is delimiter until recently you could actually use non-printable characters as delimiters too it's really really interesting um and this map uh we want to say that there's an expression here and the expression is just like this key and value of a one for each one of the foos but actually the foo is gonna go outside the map and the map only has two arguments so there's all of these things happening and now um I want to cover some more awkwardness. Uh, open is a keyword, uh, but if you were to write a parser and you the functions could have parentheses, then open maybe it would be a subroutine as well if someone used parentheses with it, because in Perl you could use parentheses with keywords, but you could also omit them. Omit them. And then QW is, is referred to as a queue-like value. It's a type of value. But did you know that you could use parentheses? You could use a space. Suddenly, now it's a subroutine. It's, it looks like it. Some, some more awkwardness. Um, you could write foo, but you could also write dollar uh, hash foo, and you could also write dollar hash dollar foo, and you could write dollar space foo. Could you do this though? Yeah, you could. Could you do this? Maybe you could. Could you do this? Could you do this? And we've been playing with parsers specifically for Perl for a while now in some intensity. And these are some of the use cases that I found. Uh, Pro bends over backwards to make some of this awkwardness actually work, which is spectacular to say the least. So some yet more awkwardness. This in Pro is a hash. These two braces, it's empty, it's a hash. But if I put a one there, now it's a block. Now I could put one comma two there and then it's a hash again. Or I could just put a comma and then it's a hash. Unless the first word there is all in lowercase and now it's a block again unless the first character is uppercase, because then it's back to being a hash. Unless the first character is lowercase, but it starts with a Q, then, yeah, okay, okay, then it's a still a hash, but then un unless, well, maybe, okay, fat comma is still a hash, and but then the QQ actually has, yeah, no, that's a hash too. Oh, unless it's QR, then it's a block again. Um, okay, that's kind of, yeah. Uh, some more awkwardness hash uh, foo that would that would work and uh, hash foo with parentheses would work some people know this some people don't what happens if i do plus foo uh, abigail is on mute but abigail i imagine would know the answers to all of these plus foo actually calls the function foo 
But minus foo, which you think would probably be similar, isn't. Minus foo is actually going to be a string minus foo. Um, what happens if I have foo written like this in, in a line in and of itself? It, it, it will call the function. If you thought that this is the same as the first line, it is not. The way I found out is because I had a hash that had one key in value and then another one. The second uh, key was caller. This is in dancer code, has a, an attribute caller. And when tidying the code, <laughs> drop the line and uh, suddenly it's not being quoted anymore. Um, what else do we have? Uh, do we have any more awkwardness? Oh yeah, of course. Um, when you see this code, this is interesting if you're writing a parser of your own. If you see this code, sub foo and a dollar, you really don't know if it's a signature or it's a prototype. And the answer as with many things in Perl is, well, it depends. Um, okay, uh, more awkwardness. So dollar and then foo in these braces, that, that will work. There's also this, this will call the function. Uh, the first one I actually call the variable. And then what happens if you have a function, but it has an empty prototype that returns a key, would you actually do dollar braces and then the string key, or would you do dollar foo? Like, which one of these would happen? So, okay, once we've seen all these different things that can happen in Perl and do happen, I wanna go back to what this talk is about. So this talk is about guacamole. We're gonna start with what guacamole is. Guacamole in a nutshell is a complete specification based unambiguous fully static parser and toolkit for standard Perl syntax, which is a mouthful. Also, you probably don't really know what I mean by standard Perl. So I'm, I'm actually gonna go back one step. So this was one, this is gonna be zero. And we're gonna talk about standard Perl. So standard Perl was an idea that I came up with um, roughly four years ago. We played with this concept of what would happen if we could make Perl unambiguous, if we could provide a specification for the language that we just know what it means and there are no more, it depends. And we started writing down all these different things. And Vikenti was the person I worked with the most on this because he knows the parser. He knows, well, he knows several different language uh, parsers, but he's also a brilliant person. And we started writing down what are the different things that are problematic? Move forward four years, I decided to pick this idea back and I started playing with flex and with bison and all these things and try to write them. And I, I went back to a project which we started documenting these things. The project was called Reimagined Guacamole, which was a joke. And um, I, I looked at it and I found that Vikenti actually wrote a bit of code. And when I dived into it further, he actually wrote something that, that tries to follow these rules. So I, I thought, oh, this would be nice. We should play with that to try and come up with these rules. So we came up with standard Perl. Standard Perl is basically a syntax specification for Perl. It is a working subset. That means that any standard Perl that you write is Perl. It does not introduce new concepts. It is 100% unambiguous and consistent, which means that it will always produce the same results. And it knows 100% what each element is. No confusion, no maybes. Also, it is fully static. You don't need to run any begin blocks, nothing. And it will parse the begin blocks as well. It is easy to write, easy to read, which is really what I wanted with standard Perl as well. The, the idea of having Perl that you could really understand and you won't have a lot of these, it depends when you explain it to someone. And when you think of things that you teach, I've been, I taught Perl for uh, almost two years as an open course. And um, it, it was difficult because every time we reached an explanation, there were so many different disclaimers and we went into, well, except when and all these things. And I wanted to be able to teach it simply because but there was so much to the language. It was just so much to explain and so many different asides. And I, I also didn't know enough of it. So I wanted a version of Perl that I could teach. I wanted a version of Perl that it would be easy to learn, easy to write a book for. So we ended up writing a BNF. If you're not familiar with the BNF, it's basically a set of rules that are written in a standardized format and parsers can use BNFs in order to write a lexer and a parser. So elements that they will 
take the, the code, they will basically decide what are the tokens in it, what am I seeing, and then they would um, tell you what those elements are and how they're combined with each other. So that's the BNF. And then that allows writing parsers. And once you have a BNF, it's a specification, it's an official thing. So what you could do is you could write it in more than one language. You could implement it in whatever language you want. For example, you could write a parser for Perl in Perl. You could write a parser for Perl in Raku. Raku specifically has a lot of parser specific bits available in the language itself, which is amazing. And you could just use that. So you could easily do this with pure Raku without any specialized stuff. You could do it with C in Java and Go. They could all write different Perl parsers because there's a specification. And it makes the Perl tooling much simpler, which is also, I think it's a big pain point for us that the tooling in Perl is, it's pretty good, but it's not as good as we could make it if we had a standardized version. Now, there's this famous sentence that says only Perl uh, can parse Perl. And you can see that one of them is in monospace and lowercase, and one of them is uppercase. And normal font. And if you're not familiar with this sentence by Tom Christensen, the, the sentence basically says that the, the Perl parser, the interpreter that we use to run our code, it is the only thing that can really parse and understand the Perl language. Because there's so many edge cases to it. There's so many different considerations. You have to compile stuff, and you have to run stuff, and you have some arbitrary code sometimes, and you have special lexing rules by the author, and let's not even get to devel declare. It's just, it, 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 yeah. So Tom basically said, you know, that the, the language itself can only be understood by the interpreter that we use to run it. And that, that really sucks because it means that nothing else could do it. So here's a, an example. This is this is a proof by Randall Schwartz. Schwartz is what you don't see in the, in the blob that's uh, hiding it. The idea is you have these two options uh, sinus and time, and um, they give you uh, one divided by 25, and the second one divided by 25. And one of these will die, one of this, these won't, even though they're written exactly the same. The reason, if you're not familiar with them or with the proof by, by Randall, is that the first one will see sin slash 25 semicolon hash slash as the statement. There's actually only one argument. The argument to the function is between two slashes. It would actually run the two slashes. That's the argument. On the other hand, time has no arguments. So you call time, it returns something, and that will get divided by 25. So that gets executed separately. So in the first example, all of this gets executed as one function and arguments one argument within the slashes and then semicolon the die. In the other case, it will divide it by 25, it's done, then the rest is a comment. Now, if we're to produce a generalized version of it, it would look, oh, there we go. It would look like this. This is proof by Randall Schwartz, generalized, is whatever you have there could be parsed separately and it really depends on the rules that Perl uses to do this and the rules will be written by a developer. Now, this is an unambiguous variation. If you wanted to make this um, unambiguous, you could just use parentheses. If you use parentheses, you can clarify what happens. The first one would just call with parentheses, run slash 25 will be done, and then there's a comment. The second one would have the parentheses there, and you could really see that that is the argument and the rest will die. So this this is one of the ways in which that we can actually just change the language a little bit. It is part of the language still, just enforce some patterns, and then it would look good. So the idea is that standard Pro will make all of this pain go away, and it does. The, there are uh, a few things that we did with standard Pro. First, we removed a few things. Simple as that. We changed how some things work, not changing the Pro language itself, but more of how we want it to be written. And that's that was basically it. So things we removed. First, autocoding. I'm going to get a lot of enemies from this. The the before I begin, I'm going to say no one has to do this. No one has to use this, but you might get some benefits if you do. So first of all, autocoding is gone. Autocoding is a mess. Not only are the rules for autocoding just I I don't I don't think English has a word for how 
crazy they are, how difficult they are. But in standard Perl, if it's a string, it is quoted. That's it. There are no other options. If it's a string, it is quoted. Now, other than auto quoting, we removed here docs because really here docs are just too wild. If you want to write a parser and you want to implement here docs for each here doc element, you need a sub parser and it's, it, and then if you have two here docs at the same, on the same line, I don't even want to get into that. We used to get, I remember one bug that we got in Perl because someone was trying to do an eval on a command line with a here doc within a regex match execution and it was like this tower of why were you even trying to and they came up with an error indirect object notation some people like this recently someone posted something on how indirect object notation is so important and i wholeheartedly disagree i do not like indirect object object notation bare word file handles are also gone except uh well if you want to actually use them you could you could print and then use file handles this way, by the way, for a print. And this, these specific bare word file handles are still supported. So if you're going to do print standard in, standard out, uh, print standard in, you probably wouldn't, but print standard out, print standard error, all of these will work. I don't know how many people knew of argv, argv out, and data probably. So they still are accepted. And obviously, you could do a print and use braces for file handles. That's also there because it's not a bare word. The underscore and you have concatenating file operators, that's gone. Because really the underscore is only meaningful when there are the previous file operators. So you really wouldn't know when you just saw an, an underscore what it is. You have to understand the context in which you're in. And then you turn into contextual parsers and those are so difficult. Given when default, why just gone. All right. These are Q like values. These are things we changed. So Q like values are things like these Q, QQ, QW, QX, QR, the M for matching, the S for search replace, the TR, and the Y. They are all considered Q like values. They are not functions, they are values. So, first of all, no nested delimiters. If you want to write this, you just need to escape them. Secondly, I never appreciated the delimiters in Perl. There were way too many delimiters for these things. We've limited it. We can obviously open them up some more if there are additional characters that make sense to have, but you know what? There has to be a limit, especially when you could use any other printable character as well if you just have a space. So yeah, that's gone. The comment, the, the comment um, symbol can also be used as a delimiter. This, no, 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 we're done, that's it. Sawyer, so I hate to do this, but can you, I'm just watching the chat, and can you just clarify that you, this is your project as- Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, not... I'm sorry. <laughs> this is not- <laughs> I think people sorry. are seeing you as, as pumpkin and, and freaking oh, out. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, this is a project that I've been working on for, for me to enforce code that I like. That is it. It is also for you to enforce code that I like, but it is not part of the language. It is not going into the language. It is not going- even near the language. So I just thank you for that uh, that request. Wow, that was that would have been uh, that would have been tough. Um, there are also no spaces before delimiters. So if you want to write something, this Q value won't count. It will not parse it. It actually says, "I don't know what this is." Instead, you have to have the delimiter close to the Q like beginning character, and that is because the parser needs to see this as a value and not get it confused with other things like uh, brackets with standard in, for example. Um, then there's Q with parentheses. So, oh, I'm sorry, this is actually backwards. I did this mistake. The Q with space, even with parentheses will also not work. This is actually a mistake. Uh, this should be correct. This is incorrect. Because the idea is that this mistake is the same mistake as this, as this. It just has parentheses, so you think it's a function. It is not a function. We just allow uh, parentheses. All right, these are changes that we've done to subroutines. Only in the specification that we have, not in the language. So all of the subroutines must use parentheses. All subroutines, no exceptions. So foo bar will not work. Foo parentheses bar will work. 
Subroutines can have attributed signatures, of course, but all subroutine prototypes must be declared using an attribute. So if you want to use prototypes and you want standard Perl to, to be consistent with standard Perl, with this, this proposed specification that is not part of the language, you would have to define the prototype this way. And then the prototypes cannot change the parsing rules. And this is something that people in Perl really, really, really like, but it is never easy to explain prototypes, never. So this does not work. Even though we really like it, it's not actually good. It's not readable for people who are not familiar with prototypes. And then you have to explain that a developer somewhere else has provided parsing rules for the code that you wrote. Yeah, it's very weird. So instead we're gonna write it this way. I do wanna say, however, if you're thinking of things like Mojo, Dancer, um, Moose, they have, in a sense, their own grammar. So we have an open issue. We're working on introducing pluggable grammars. So you could say, I want this to be Perl, but I also want this to use the Moose grammar so it can understand that this is like Moose keywords and, and how they behave. All right, some more changes. Um, right. So this is class names. So changes to class names. The left of an arrow is always an invocant, never a function. So this is a common mistake. Um, it, there's, there's, this actually is enforced with code after the fact, but uh, the idea is that when you write foo arrow bar, theoretically, it could be also a function. But really when you do that, it's almost always incorrect. It's almost always a mistake. I have, I imagine people have done this before, but I have never actually witnessed someone write this and meaning to run a function called foo. So instead, the the this is not okay. If there is a case that it detects that you had foo, but you also define the function called foo, it will give you an error. Namespaces cannot end with a double colon. So this is one way to disambiguate it. There are people who write this. Um, at the moment, this is not supported. I will say that we could support it. I just haven't decided that this is like syntax that I would like people to write. If people ask me what is clean Perl, I don't know if I would recommend this because I think it's a bit obtrusive, a bit, I don't know, kind of clunky. It looks weird. Um, some changes to the referencing. Uh, prefix the referencing is, is only supported with braces. This is one thing that bothered me all the time. I hated seeing code like this. When I taught Perl, I once showed dollar dollar foo. And every time I showed it to people and I said, okay, this is less readable. I remember at least once or twice, someone would raise their hand and say, well, there's just one dollar. What's the problem? They didn't even notice there were two dollar signs. So that's you can't do that. Just use braces, it works just fine. Post fix the referencing is of course supported. This, by the way, will not work because F is a bare word. So that will not succeed. Okay, uh, one change to expressions, which I think is important. A map that attempts to return a pair must use parentheses. So this will not work. Instead, you can just use this and then it becomes an expression and that's great. The plus with the parentheses that some people write, I write it a lot, that still works. All right, so now we've covered this idea of a specification that you could write in. Okay, now the whole idea with that is to actually write something that could parse it if we had this. So now that we sat down and we wrote a BNF that can deal with this, we wrote a parser that could deal with this. And that parser is called guacamole. Now guacamole also includes additional tooling that I'll show, but this is the core of it. So going back to what I said it was, it is a complete specification based. Now you've seen the specification. It is unambiguous. It is fully static. It does not need to run any begin blocks. And it provides a toolkit if you write in what I just referred to as standard Perl. So if you're writing it, you get to use guacamole. And if you don't, that's okay. Perl, the interpreter will run it, but guacamole will say, sorry, I don't know this. All right, so how does it work? Um, the rundown. Um, we use MARPA to specify standard Perl BNF. MARPA uses the BNF to parse every Perl string it sees, which must comply with this specification. And Guacamole using MARPA will return an AST, which is an abstract syntax tree. And you're probably wondering, wait a minute, what's MARPA? What are you talking about? Jeffrey Kegler, 
I'm sorry that you can't see the name. Uh, Jeffrey Kegler wrote MARPA. He has written numerous articles on it. It is excellent. It's great. I love it. Uh, you can find, first of all, information here. I really recommend it. It is a parsing algorithm. It's fast. In linear time, it will uh, parse all the grammar classes that recursive descent parses, it, the grammar class that the Yak family parses. It can even parse unambiguous grammar. So we can parse things into more than one option. So theoretically, you could parse all of these cases and say, it could be this, it could be that, but obviously that wouldn't be in linear time. It receives a specification in BNF and applies that, that algorithm. So it generates a parser from the BNF. If you've used any other parsers, it's difficult. And uh, with, with MARPA, you can really write a full-fledged BNF and you get a full parser back. And it's, it's great. And you can customize every single bit of it. So you can customize every node. You can write a lot of code before, after, during. You can even receive a response that it couldn't do something and that it doesn't know what to do. And then you can try to fix it and go, oh, you know what, then you should do this. And then you can iteratively parse with the back and forth with the parser, which is just amazing. So it's it's great. Uh, Jeffrey, we reached out to him. We spoke to him. And he provided feedback. He is He's very helpful. If you're interested in MARPA, if you're interested in its development, you could also donate to it. All right. So what does an AST look like? This is a tool that we have um, to provide an explanation. We give it a string, and then it gives us the AST. Now, the AST that we have provides a lot of data. And we're going to clean it up. But at the moment, this is what you're going to get. If you give it foo equals 1, you're going to get this entire thing. There's quite a bit here. I want to point out specifically the dollar, the foo, the equal, and the 1. So these are the, the actual values that you were seeing in the input string without the white space. Now, if I were to draw that AST that you just saw, because it's it's actually a tree, it's an abstract syntax tree, it, it represents what we wrote. So it starts with a program. Program has a statement sequence. Then within that sequence, there is one statement, which is an expression of assignment that is equal. Then on one side of it, it'll have a value, which is then, it, this is our specification. So it's a value. It's a non-literal value. It is a variable value. And that is a variable a scalar, and that is a dollar. It also parses it to a variable identifier expression, and that is foo. On the other side of the equal, you have a value. Yeah. It is a literal value, and it is a literal number value. And that will be equal to 1. And this is how you actually get this dollar foo equals 1. It generates this tree where there's an equal at the top, and then on one side of it, there's dollar foo, and on another side of it, there's 1. And you can actually walk that tree. And what Perl would do, Perl generates something like this, except Perl needs to run a bunch of stuff in order to determine what this really is. And in some cases, it determines some of it. So uh, Perl will generate this, and then Perl will basically walk this and say, OK, if I have an equal, and I have this, and I have this, then I'm going to you know, apply these and create some kind of C structure. And these parts are called lexemes. The rest are called rules. These are really the lexemes. Uh, so um, what could you use guacamole for? So things you could do with it. First, you could improve quality. You could write and maintain all these code policies, stuff like Perl Critic, you could do with uh, guacamole. You could spot duplications and refactor your code. You could do some automatic rewriting, which is really nice. And of course, you can transpile languages, which I think is really nice. So I'm going to go into each one separately. We're going to start with linting. Let me just make sure I'm on time. Yeah, I'm doing good. OK, so linting. Procritic is the de facto linter. And it uses PPI to parse Perl files as documents. So it doesn't actually understand a tree structure. It understands this document that says, I have a white space character. I have a string here. And I think it's going to be a word. And yeah. And the thing is, it's, it, PPI itself is very vague. And that's difficult. Um, it works really, 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 really hard to get to where it is. I saw one pull request that Vicente wrote for PPI when we were writing policies at work because we worked together and I, it was it was over my head. 
And PPI obviously is not an AC, it's not a tree, it's just document. So you, you need to walk through a document, but there's no, not much of a relationship between them. Now, PPR is a different thing. It's very, very strong. It was written by Damien Conway. So it's obviously brilliant as the man is, and it really, really, really is amazing. So you should check that out. But Pearl Credit is based on PPI instead. PPR is pure, is a pure Pearl. So all of this specification done in like really vast, intricate regexes. And it supports way more than guacamole supports. FYI, because it's, it's Damien. Now, linting, instead of using PPI, Pearl Credit could theoretically use guacamole. It helps implement more complicated policies, and it, it is much easier to do that. So the, the only problem, of course, is that it could only then work with things that are standard Perl, but it will definitely be more accurate. And band syntax obviously doesn't parse, so we don't need to work around it. We have quite a few policies on Perl Critic for syntax that is on, on, Perl, on, on Meta C band for Perl Critic, things that that don't work or shouldn't work. They're just bad code, they're badly written, but Perl will parse it and will either understand it and do something or it will not understand and do something else. But because this is a specification for correct code, it doesn't mean that it's good code, but it is correct code. I don't even need these policies. I was trying to rewrite some of them and then I realized some of these I don't even need, which is great, drop those. The correct syntax is fully identifiable. In PPI, it's very common to say, this is a word, well, that's, very good, but what is this? What is this word? So it doesn't really know. In most cases, elements are are unambiguous with guacamole. There is no uh, maybe it's this thing, maybe it's that thing, and you don't need to account for different coding styles and spacing, which is something that I have to continuously do, because someone might have written in a really arcane pattern, and they that's just they just did. So now I have to account for that case. This is an example of difficulties with PPI. Uh, I'm getting the next, sibling, so I'm checking if there is no next sub, significant sibling, which means that it has to jump over the spacing and, but there is a next token that I need to exhaust the spaces, which is like a copy paste line that I have everywhere. And then I need to move to the next token. Then it can continue from there. This is a piece of code that I wrote. It's not, not that complicated to understand. Here, um, as you can see, it's just like this thing, I copy paste all the time. These are the comments that I have for it. I, this checks that you wrote for, and then you wrote class, and then you wrote method, and then you wrote foo, and it, this, it needs to do all of this. So it actually has to, like, I need, the, I need all of this in, in front of me because it is very hard for me to understand what this code is even meant to do. Because you would think this is a simple code. Of course you would remember. No, I wouldn't. There's this code. This code checks, I, I called it, check if it's a symbol or a cast. Because it is, PPI doesn't tell me which one it is. And when it tries to, it could get it wrong. So I actually had to write custom code. And the custom code says, take this argument. If it's a symbol and it begins with a percent or it is a cast, but is definitely only a percent, then okay. It then, then continue working, otherwise just stop. Then you need to get the next significant sibling because we might get a space. Then check if that is a cast and if the, the one after that is a block. And if so, then the one after that is the next significant. Then I need to check for more operators. So check if the next one is an op and if so, return. Otherwise, yes. I'm not sure how this works, to be honest. I've seen, I was looking at this uh, a little while ago. I have no idea how this works. Okay, more linting. I'm gonna to have to go even faster. So there's no, uh, oh, someone, yeah, maybe they're writing that one. There's no, I need to figure out what this is. This is the most common PPI token. In almost every case, you get this one and you don't know what it is. Uh, did they write, it was a syntax or was it that one? Uh, maybe there's a space or it could be a new line. So, okay, let's put this aside. Duplication detection. This is really, really cool. So I wanna show you this idea. With the guacamole, with obviously the help uh, Marpa, it will return a tree, it will return like this, all of these operations. And what it could do is I can also take some elements and fold them. So I can basically say, oh, if I'm seeing these, I'm going to chuck all these out. And then eventually I can compare these trees of code. And I know that if the trees are correct, it is 100% correct. So this is really nice. And then you can detect trees that while they are different trees, semantically, they actually are the same idea. 
they do the same thing. And if you do that, you can also detect trees that are not optimized. It's really also really cool. And then you could rewrite that using a different tree and write code instead that is optimized. So this is an example of folding elements in the AST. I'm using the tools explain uh, one for items. And I'm getting this nice output back. It shows me all the elements in. Now, this is an example. Oh, I have been here. It's under, uh, I renamed it incorrectly. So now I'm trying to do one for items again, and I'm getting a different one. Now, if you know that the difference the difference really is, is this, there, there's parentheses here, but it's significantly different trees because one generates an expression, an additional expression. And if I look for it, I can actually find it right there. There's a, paren a parentheses expression, which has a lexeme of a left paren, then an expression value, and then a right paren. If I remove those and say, well, you know what, those are the same, having and not having is the same code, and I fold it, I get this return. And then obviously I have a value, not literal, value, not literal. This is unnecessary, so I can remove one of them. And then I folded that. And now these are equivalent, which means that I could find this as a duplicate, right? This is really cool. All right, uh, transpiling between uh, languages. I think it's also really, really nice. So if you understand, I, mean, I actually haven't done this, so it's just theory. If you understand every operation and value in the code, then you can rewrite it in a different language. You can optimize it by replacing one tree with the other. You can convert between languages. So you can move Perl to C, just rewrite it. You can write it in C++ or in Go, in Java, or in Ruby, you know, or in Raku. Now, of course, you might lose some of the strength of one language and another. So if I were to read Raku and try to output Perl, I would actually have to, for, for quite a few things, I would have to put way more effort. But if I were to convert Perl to Raku, that would probably be easy because Raku can express Perl fairly easily. Um, but then if I were to convert Perl to C, I would have to write a lot of C. So uh, LVM, of course, um, maybe convert it to JavaScript. Uh, Good to note here, the web Perl by Hauke, and uh, you can find it in web Perl 0G because that is already available. And uh, Graham also gave a talk about web, web assembly that you can find right there. So I really recommend checking his work and uh, Hauke's work. Uh, automatic rewriting, uh, basically it, it's simple. You identify crappy code trees and you rewrite them, it's good code. And that's it. And that is equal to profit because that might be faster. Let me give you an example. This is code that I've actually seen at work in more than one company, okay? We do it for each. Then we have tags that we're getting from the database. We're checking if a person has these tags and if he does or she does, we will do something about that. So that specific line for the DB search is not using the person that we're iterating on. We just use an ID, which means that it will run every time. And if that search is heavy, then we're running a ton of queries. What we actually want is to pull out all the way up there and then just use that data. So this is an example of something that you could detect with trees more easily than with strings. This is an example of something I actually had to write in uh, PPI. I actually wrote this, it's available as Refutil Rewriter, but it, it's a lot of work. There's a lot of comments just to understand what I'm supposed to do there. Okay, what else do we have? So. Vikenti and I have written a few development tools. First, other than the parser itself, we wrote a parser. The parser itself is 100%, like it is working. You can pick it up, you can try it. It's on CPAN now. Um, we also wrote a pragma. This is really cool. If you go to CPAN, you also have use standard. I'm gonna show that later. We also wrote a linter, so similar to ProCritic. It's a minimal implementation, and there's an example of a rewrite. So it's kind of cool that you could use to also rewrite some stuff. Uh, there's also a, a policies and examples, so you could play with those. And um, there's a, a deep parser that is used for the rewriter. So it basically, the original version just took all the lexems and just printed them out, and then it would do that. But uh, we've improved it. The parser allows you to tokenize and generate the AST. So uh, top marks for Vikenti rewriting it at least twice or three times after I raised the bug that I had no idea how to solve. Um, 
it helps enforce the standard using the problem. So if you want your team or you want your code to be standardized and to always use this nice syntax, you can use the pragma and it will make sure that you're always within that standard. This pragma will not be going into core. It is irrelevant to core. There's a linter that allows you to maintain code quality and the, the parser along with the rewriter allows you to semantically rewrite code. Here's an example of the parser. You can just do guacamole parse. You get an HD back. Um, you get the parser element. So you basically get this element that has the column, the length, the line, the name, the start position, and the type, and all the children. So this is for every rule element. You actually know which line the rule is on, which column the rule is on, how long the rule is, what type of rule it is, uh, what, what is the name of that rule, and all of the children related to that rule. And we have a lexem that has a value and a type. The name here does exist and it is empty. So you wouldn't have to, when you want to just compare names, you wouldn't have to check whether it is a lexem or a rule first because I hated doing that. So I added an empty name. Use standard, the program is also on CPAN. And if you turn on use standard, it basically grabs all the code, runs it through the parser and then tells you if there's a mistake. Let me give you an example. My class, new class is not supported under standard Perl. But if you try to use the Perl interpreter with it, and we're going to use BD parse here to check it, what it's going to do is tell you this is class, and then there's a string class calling new. This is what I understand. Now, if you were to add your standard, now you're going to have a problem because it's going to say file does not pass standard Perl. The parser says, and there's like a bunch of stuff from the parser, and it will also say, I failed to parse past a certain point, and then it gives you the rest of it. So the stuff from the BD parse will still work. It didn't actually break the program. It didn't um, exit it. But it does tell you that it didn't pass. It does tell you what actually happened, where it stopped, what it expected, which is super useful because you could say it, it got to new and then it had a problem. And it will even say, I actually, after new, expected one of the following things to happen. So let's say we write it this way. That will still not work. And it will tell you, hey, no, 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 I understand class, I understand arrow, I understand new, but here I expect either a left parenthesis and then probably arguments and a right parenthesis or a packet separator because you can call new colon colon something else. I mean, if I add those, suddenly this will work just fine. No complaints, no nothing. This is an example of the linter. It's a, a, an object oriented uh, structure just because I wanted to play with stuff like that. So the syntax might change as it evolves, but it basically gives you lint okay, lint not okay. You can have the policy and then prints out and tap um, okay or not okay, whether it was able to uh, understand or not. This is an example of the, de the deparser that you will have to use if you're writing a rewriter. It is a form of rewriter, just a very clean one. This is an example where we give it a deep parse of the string, and it has a lot of spaces in it and lack of spaces in it. And what it does is just print it out really nicely. Um, you could be much smarter about this and say, if there are, um, if there's only one argument in the expression, I'm going to um, put the parentheses a bit closer. If there is nothing within the uh, braces. I'm actually not going to have a space. There's like a bunch of stuff you could do like that. And it's fairly easy to do them. Now, I reached the end of the talk. It's It was quite long, quite exhausting, quite fast. But I owe a lot of thanks. And Vikenti owes a lot of thanks with me to all of these people. So my personal thanks first goes to Vikenti, who's not able to talk because he put himself on mute and he will probably be too shy. So I get a chance to say that it is incredible to work with this person. He is brilliant. And, and I, I feel like I got to play with the thing that he created and then I get to talk about it. But it really is his um, his abilities that 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 brought us here. Um, Damien Conway has been a tremendous help in spotting everything that could go wrong and going into great depth to explain to me why I don't understand. And he's been very patient because I've had a lot of uh, back and forth. And oh, but what if we were to do this or what if we were to do that? And Damien's like, no, man, no, that's not gonna, no, that's not gonna happen. Um, Jeffrey Kugler has been very supportive as well, as well and very helpful and, and helped us understand quite a few 
more complicated patterns and how to avoid them and how to understand parsers better. I will say that it was mostly for me because Vicente does understand them. Gonzalo Dithelm is, is a, a colleague and a dear, dear, dear friend who also is very strong with this topic. So he was able to enlighten us to quite a few things. And Tux was helpful by giving me a very large piece of code and saying, try to see if it works. And uh, we spotted quite a few bugs with it. So Tux, thank you for always jumping in and saying, um, I'll give you something to play with um, to see if your, your thing will break or not. So that is for our talk. Uh, thank you very much from both Vikenti and myself. And uh, that is the end, thank you. You can find uh, Standard on MetaCPAN, you can find Guacamole on MetaCPAN, and this GitHub link should work within a few minutes after I finish the talk because it's currently named differently. That is it. I'm going to do a stop on the share. I think Al Newkirk has a question. So um, does anyone have any questions for either myself or Vikenti because he's on, on, the, um, on the call as well? Um, I should actually open the participants. Uh, and you can raise your hand, I'll, I'll see it. Okay, well, I'll share because he's not. Um, his question was, he wonders if guacamole parser ignores pod and comments. Yes, so uh, specifically guacamole ignores, um, it, it disregards uh, spaces except where we forced it to recognize and not accept, like with Q values, if you do Q and then a space, it will not disregard it. It will actually break on purpose. Uh, we do this with a few specific things, um, but otherwise it ignores spaces, it ignores comments, and uh, it ignores pod because pod is considered, uh, at least by me, to be its own its own language and thus needs its own parser. So just like Perl, it basically ignores it. You could write it in line at the end, you could write the end, you could write the, the data, uh, all of those and it will just, nothing will break. It's really nice. I see a question in chat. Um, is there mm -hmm. any particular reason why the name guacamole was chosen? It will oh. be hard to Google given that there is Apache guacamole and normal guacamole. Right. Um, yes, it is not a good reason. Um, when we were playing with this idea about four years ago, we were just trying to throw out like what kind of things are problematic for us if we wanted to, to really um, uh, parse Perl with no ambiguity. And we, we opened the, I opened the repo and Git, GitHub just added this ability to kind of give you random names for repos to, to inspire creativity. So I, um, I picked a few and then I kind of tweaked it and I came up with reimagined guacamole because reimagined is like this really nice idea of rethinking it. And then uh, I like guacamole. Um, I am not adverse in any way to renaming it. Um, Vikenti and I are, Vikenti I imagine is also quite open to whatever name we give it that makes sense. Um, so no uh, strong, um, no strong uh, opinion there. I do see that someone said that it, it is delicious and makes your code delicious. So um, any, any other questions? Uh, oh, I see um, someone asked about um, use constant foo42. Um, if you quote foo, yes, it will work. But it will not recognize foo from, foo from that point on unless you use parentheses on it. So if you want to use constants, you need to put parentheses on them, which is personally what I do because I, then I could avoid any uh, conflicts with, with uh, constants and auto-quoting in Perl and stuff like that. And bare words, obviously. Um, Two people have their hands up. William T. Uh, Okay. Yes. Uh, William, sorry. I didn't, oh, I didn't see the symbol. Right. William, please. Yeah. I was just curious with use standard. Um, would you leave that on in production running code? How much sort of overhead does it add like on startup and whatnot? Uh, you found something. Yes. Uh, Currently, it has more overhead than I would recommend to have in production code, unless the code is being compiled and then stored. So for the code that I work on, almost all of it gets uploaded to memory once every, uh, every well, a few times a day usually, but that's it, then it's up there. 
So if I can just, I, I preload everything that I can and it just sits in memory and then I don't care if it took another two seconds, but it is like, it is like it could hit seconds uh, in some cases. Um, so I want to look at how to parse it faster. There are a lot of ways. So we're going to, we're going to optimize it at some point. But one thing that we might do is maybe have a flag that says that only under development, it runs you standard. So that's, that's an option. Um, similar to some of the testing stuff that Perl does. Uh, any ideas, you know, the, the GitHub's there and, and uh, please open a ticket. I will rename it soon. Uh, open a ticket and uh, my time is done. I'll, uh, uh, we'll, we'll review it. We'll talk about it and find a good, a good way to deal with it. Um, Rolf? Lanex? Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, sorry, I have to apologize if it was asked already because I'm catching up on YouTube. Um, you mentioned BD parse. BD parse is written in Perl and passes the op tree. Did you consider using this? Yes. Uh, BD parse requires compiling Perl, um, which means yeah. that it will run arbitrary code. Guacamole doesn't run any code, zero. Okay. Other than guacamole. It's because of the static part. Yeah. Because I could um, it was also difficult. It's also difficult to work with the um, B. Uh, the whole B infrastructure, the M, uh, the O infrastructure, um, you get like a callback, and it's if you look at the BD parse code, it's it's difficult. It's difficult, and I'm not that. Good. I know it. I know it, but maybe one could use if you're confident with running your code, one could use BD parse to normalize it to your standard, and then use your tools on the end. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, but then you wouldn't be able to uh, actually, actually you take to that it, away but... as a BNF. So you wouldn't have a standard. So that doesn't fix it. So even if I could do this, it wouldn't really achieve the overall thing that I want. Because now a an ID written in Java can say, well, I'm going to take this BNF, I'm going to parse the code, and then give better hints and better syntax highlighting and stuff like that. I wouldn't do that with BD parse. Um, before, Devin, before I, uh, I, I let you ask a question on the forum, uh, the the parser does not parse pod but it does not screw up the line numbers so both the line numbers and the the columns are correct even though it just does not uh give you pod and says this is the pod that i found it's sorry the pod that you find is not part of the pearl syntax so you don't get it if you want get a pod extractor all right um devin yeah, so how come you don't um, base this around PPR instead, since that's a regular expression based, and I know it's not BNF, well, maybe it could be converted to one, but it does not parse the Perl code, you know, it doesn't actually execute any Perl code, it's simply parsing it and supports a lot more of the syntax. Yes, um, good point, several reasons. Um, and so for, for the sake of argument, uh, PPR supports more things, PPR is also static, PPR is written by someone way smarter, um, and um, and it is much, much, much faster at the moment. Now, the reason I, I didn't want to use it is because first, I wouldn't be able to generate the standard. I could only generate like a, a really big regex. It's not even using parse rect descent, so it doesn't, it doesn't have a standard. It's basically uh, uh, the ability to parse it with a, a complicated regex. Secondly, I wouldn't be able, because of that, to port it to other languages. Third, I wouldn't be able to create a variation of Perl that is so unambiguous and clear and easy to explain to others and to teach and to learn. So if I were to write a Perl book or if I were to write documentation, I would only match standard Perl because I would want it to be the easiest to understand, the easiest to follow. Basically, if you write this, you have less headache. And that's one of the things that I wanted to do with, uh, with guacamole. And Vikenti just likes doing stuff like implementing excess in Rust for example. So because it's always, yeah, let's do it. Why not? Um, I think we're out of time. Yes. Uh, 